I want to thank everyone for having us um, here today and um, really, really, I'm so appreciative that um, Regina could come. We call her Reggie, but Regina could come and, and help us out today. Um, women have participated in some way in the military and in war from the American Revolution all the way up to the present. Uh, some of them have participated have participated as military personnel, while others served in support roles or in journalistic roles that help shed light on combat and military culture. However, women are usually portrayed, both in literature and in historical record, as one of three things during war. Cause of war, think Helen of Troy. Spoils of war, women and children were often kidnapped as rewards for the victorious side. And strategies of war, strategic marriages for purposes of forming political alliances. There are, of course, some notable exceptions and some notable instances where women played a significant role in combat or in strategy. And over our time, our society has shifted to allow women to, to assume a much larger role in our military efforts. Women have been moving from the causes of spoils and strategies of war to being direct participants, documenters, and strategists. Before the United States was a nation, women found many ways to contribute to the Patriot cause. All there, their roles were limited. They served as nurses, cooks, and water carriers, and assisted their husbands and other men with tasks. Women were also recruited for important work as spies and saboteurs. Still, other women disguise themselves as men to engage in combat. When their roles are remembered, it's most often a romanticized version. Most often, however, these women have been largely forgotten. For example, you've probably heard of Paul Revere who rode through Boston to alert the Minutemen that the British were coming. His midnight ride is lauded in a famous poem by, poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. You may not have heard, however, of a young woman who accomplished a similar task that helped save the city of Danbury, Connecticut, from British attack. In 1970, in, excuse me, in 1777, Sybil Ludington was just 16 years old when she was sent on a harrowing mission to rouse the American militiamen and alert them that British forces were advancing on Danbury where there was a strategic supply depot. She rode more than 40 miles, twice the distance of Paul Revere's, to muster 400 militiamen who arrived too late to fully stop the British, but managed to protect many of Danbury's citizens. Formal female involvement with the military did not begin until 1811, when the first female nurses were allowed in US Naval hospitals. In the 1830s, U.S. Coast Guard first allowed women to officially serve as lighthouse keepers, though women had unofficially been fulfilling these duties for many years and often taking over from their husbands or their fathers. By the start of the Civil War in 1861, women had gained access to some higher education opportunities and had begun to filter into more medical positions and served in official capacities as nurses and doctors. As the U.S. entered World War I, sending more and more troops overseas, military officials also began to employ women for various clerical roles, stenographers, telephone operators, etc., in order to free men for combat service functions. However, at the end of the war, these women were simply dismissed from their jobs and sent home. In 1920, the Army Reorganization Act gave military nurses relative rank, but not rights and privileges associated with those ranks. Women could hold ranks from second to lieutenant through major, but no higher. World War II saw an expansion of opportunities for women, and the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was formed in 1942. One of the first women to sign up was a Stanford native, Colonel Ruth Lucas. Ruth Lucas, who was chosen for officer training from out of 35,000 applicants. This early selection, however, did not mean better treatment. As one of 40 black women in training, she was required to sleep in a separate barracks, use separate restroom facilities, and sit at a separate table in the mess hall. In 1947, the Air Force became an independent branch of the military, and Lucas attended Air Force officer training, although she never learned how to fly. Despite, despite blatant discrimination through her career, both for her gender and the color of her skin, Lucas also received many commendations and earned the Bronze Star Award. In 
In 1968, she became the first African-American woman to attain the rank of colonel in the U.S. Air Force. It was not until 1995 that an African-American woman achieved a higher rank when Marcellette Harris of Texas was promoted to Major General. During the Vietnam War, women continued to serve mainly as nurses and in support roles and never in a combat zone. During this time, President Lyndon Johnson lifted some restrictions on women in the mil military, including the 2% cap on female enlistments, and allowed women, women full access to all military ranks. But it wasn't until 1973 that pregnancy was no longer a cause for automatic discharge. In 1975, Congress ushered in a new era for women in the U.S. military, when it opened all military academies to female students. The first co-ed class graduated in 1980, and since then, women have moved into more and more positions in the military establishment. In the first Gulf War, more than 40,000 women deployed to the Middle East, demonstrating that women were capable if given the opportunity. Remember, women are still not able to serve in combat roles during this time. And in fact, even in the more recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, women were excluded from roles designated as too dangerous for them. Which brings us up to the present day. Women have been making great strides in their participation in war and military activities over the last five years in particular. In 2013, combat restrictions were lifted and all military positions were open to women. In 2015, inductee Captain Kristen Grice from Orange, Connecticut, graduated from Army Ranger School as one of the first two women ever. She later became the Army's first female infantry officer ever. Because of these women who came before and broke these barriers, more women are now entering into military careers participating in military activities, deploying to war zones, and are excelling while doing all of these things. If you would like to learn more about these women or any of the other 121 inductees in the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame, please visit, visit our website at cwhf.org. One of the unique things that the Hall does to preserve the stories of their inductees is to produce an eight to 10 minute tribute film of their lives and careers. Here to tell us more about her experiences, please welcome Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame 2017 inductee, retired Connecticut State Police Major, and U.S. Army Command Sergeant Major, currently the Deputy Commission of the Connecticut State Division of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, Regina Rush Kittle. Good afternoon, guests and friends who have taken the time out of your busy work and personal life schedules to attend this presentation honoring women recognized during Women's History Month. Women's History Month is an annual observance which declares the highlights and contributions of women who have made history in our society. It is also an annual observance during the month of March in the United States United Kingdom and Australia, corresponding with International Women's Day, which is celebrated um, this year on March 8th. In Canada, it is celebrated during the month of October. In the US, Women's History Month traces its beginning back to the first International Women's Day in 1911. Following several successful celebrations of what became known as Women's History Week, in 1980, President Jimmy Carter issued a presidential proclamation declaring the week of March 8, 1980 as National Women's History Week. To quote, too often the women were unsung and sometimes their contributions went unnoticed. But the achievements, leadership, courage, strength, and love of women who built America was as vital to that of men whose names we know so well. 
scourge had begun, and by 1986, 14 states had declared March as Women's History Month. In 1987, Congress passed resolution designating the month of March 1987 as Women's History Month, and between 1988 and 1994, additional resolution was passed requesting and authorizing the President to proclaim March of each year as Women's History Month. So we get a whole month now. Presidential proclamations from 1988 through 2019 have been made with an annual theme. The theme for 2019 is Visionary Women, Champions of Peace and Nonviolence. A number of pioneering women who should be recognized during Women's History Month include Harriet Tubman, an American abolitionist and political activist. Born into slavery, Tubman escaped and subsequently made 13 missions to rescue numerous enslaved people, family, and friends using a network of anti-slavery activists and safe houses known as the Underground Railroad. Susan B. Anthony, an American social reformer and women's rights activist who played a pivotal role in the women's suffrage movement. When she first began campaigning for women's rights, she was harsh, harshly ridiculed for trying, as trying to destroy the institution of marriage. She later became the first woman depicted on a U.S. coin when her portrait appeared on the 1979 dollar coin. Shirley Chisholm, who in 1968 became the first African-American woman elected to the United States Congress, and in 1972 became the first black candidate for a major party's nomination for president of the United States, and the first woman to run for the Democratic Party's presidential nomination. And in Connecticut, I somehow managed to become an African-American woman first. So now that you've heard a short summary of the history of Women's History Month, and some of the women recognized Please let me briefly share my story as an African-American woman, a veteran, and a law enforcement officer. My journey as the first, and to this day, the only African-American woman on the Middletown Connecticut Police Department, the first of many firsts on the Connecticut State Police, and one of the first women veterans inducted into the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame. My journey began as a young black girl born in the inner city of Baltimore, Maryland, who later believed by the time I entered Middletown High School here in Connecticut that I could be everything. At Middletown High School, I was in the Glee Club, I was in the Leaders Club, the Afro-American Club, as we referred to it then, the Latin American Club. And no, I am not Hispanic, but I took Spanish class and I wanted to be involved, so they said I was, it was decided that I could join the club. I was a member of the yearbook staff. I played varsity softball, basketball, and volleyball, and was a major rep. So think of this, the female class athlete and captain of the major reps. Those things don't even normally go together. Um, but I, I wanted to be everything. So, but by the time I got to the stores campus at UConn, I had decided that I also wanted to be in the military. So this was my dilemma. I needed to focus, find my niche, and be the best at what I chose. During my sophomore year of college, I thought I had figured it out. I would join the reserves to serve my country, allowing me to pursue another career beyond college. Uh, my initial goal was to be the first female Supreme Court Justice. But that same year, Sandra Day O'Connor was appointed to the United States Supreme Court. So I had to refocus and come up with another plan. I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps Reserves during the winter break of my junior year. And due to my test scores, the recruiter told me that I could enlist in any branch of the military and have a wide variety of career choices. But the Marines would be the toughest challenge. That was enough said. I had to be a Marine. So days after the spring semester ended, 
I was on my way to the airport in a bus load of military recruits headed to various basic training sites across the country. The bus was loaded with males and two females. The two of us being the only ones headed to Paris Island, South Carolina to become Marines. The Marine Corps instilled and established the foundation of my military career, which I attribute to my continued success in the military. A few years later, as I began my career in law enforcement, first with the Department of Corrections and then by joining the Middletown Police Department, I still believe that the training that I received in the Municipal Police Academy established the foundation of my law enforcement career as I continued on to become a Connecticut State Trooper. During my transition from the Marine Corps to the Army, even though I was already a police officer, uh, after being told that I was too short to be a military police officer due to height requirements at that time, my recruiter suggested that I become an Army Reserve Drill Sergeant. I was hooked. So this was a position that would allow me to train soldiers and instill a sense of pride, commitment, discipline, and dedication. The same principles that I had learned during my training and was, has been forever instilled in me. So that was my focus for many years. And I continued my career with the Connecticut State Police. And if I could be a drill sergeant in the military, why not take those same traits and training into my career? So four years after joining the State Police, uh, Academy, State Police, I became an instructor at the State Police Academy. Calling cadence, shouting out commands, training, instilling a sense of pride in soldiers, troopers, and local law enforcement officers, the best of both worlds. I absolutely loved it. And to this day, being a drill sergeant and a State Police Academy instructor are some of my fondest memories. And there are still soldiers and law enforcement officers who I run into this day that cannot forget my very big voice. <laughs> so trust me, I'm being very professional here, but I really don't need this microphone because they could hear me through many areas in this building. <laughs> At this point in my life, I was running a household. I was a mother, a former Marine, current drill sergeant, a Connecticut State Trooper, and still I had those moments when I wanted to be everything. So back to college for my master's degree. And during this time, I began my first with the Connecticut State Police when I was promoted to the rank of sergeant. Now, as you are all aware, things changed significantly in our country um, following the attacks on the World Trade Center in 2001. This also changed the course of my dual military and uh, law enforcement career. In February 2003, I was promoted, received a phone call at 5.30 p.m. on the following Wednesday, and exactly 36 hours at 5.30 a.m. that Friday, I left my family en route to my first year, first one year combat zone tour. In those 36 hours in between, I spent the first few hours in total shock. Then I began to pack two duffel bags, I did my family laundry, I braided my daughter's hair, I updated my will, I created a power of attorney so that my husband could sign all the documents while I was away, I broke the news to my 16-year-old son and my four-year-old daughter at dinner that Thursday evening, I turned in my duty equipment and my car to the state police, and I took a nap and I left home at 5.30 Friday morning. I joined a unit in Massachusetts, trained in Fort Drum, New York for six weeks in temperatures that ranged from 35 degrees below zero during our night training to a high of 36, which to all of us by now felt like spring. And we then landed in Kuwait in March of 2003 where the temperature was almost 100 degrees when we exited the plane. And while in Kuwait, we served as a higher headquarters for all of the medical units, 
hospitals, ambulances, and um, medical supply distributions for the Iraq war. We worked long hours, uh, conditions were hot, there were horrendous sandstorms, and there were attacks that required us to rush into sandbag bunkers. Initially, we were housed in large air-conditioned tents, which we had to erect ourselves on pre-stage platform, uh, pre-stage plywood platforms. And when we moved into the newly constructed housing building, it was not a joyous occasion because it meant that although Saddam Hussein had been captured, we were one of the units that were identified as staying in place and not going home anytime soon. So as a form of stress relief, I ran one and a half hours almost daily from 4.30 in the morning to six o'clock to beat the heat before my duty day began. Almost a year to the day after my departure, I returned to Massachusetts and reunited with my family. After returning home and spending several weeks with my family, I returned to work with the Connecticut State Police and resumed my career in the uh, Army Reserves. And within a few months after returning home, I was allowed a short extension due to my deployment to prepare for the Connecticut State Police promotional exam. But I knew that I just couldn't pass the test. I had to go beyond. So I scored number one on both the lieutenant's and the master sergeant's exam and was promoted to the rank of lieutenant, being the first African-American woman to attain the rank in the department's 100-year history. During my time in Kuwait, in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, there were other soldiers and military members serving in Afghanistan. And at that time, it was more of a quiet war. No one really heard about Afghanistan during that time. Um, there was not a lot on the news, and unless you were in the military or had a military, uh, or knew somebody from the military that was over in Afghanistan, you didn't hear a lot about it. But as time passed, we know that that all changed. So by 2008, 2009 timeframe, I was serving in a reserve unit in East Windsor, Connecticut. And we all knew that a deployment was upcoming. We did a combined training um, session, mission, with our sister unit in Texas. And we knew that they would be deploying soon. They were short of personnel. And when they asked for volunteers, I raised my hand, volunteering for deployment number two. I was selected to fill the last position on the command team. The command team is comprised of three members, the commander, the command sergeant major, and the executive officer. Our Harrier headquarters made the decision to select me to fill the last position as a command sergeant major, making us, if not the first, but at that time, the only all-female command team in Afghanistan. So I left my Connecticut unit, which was only 20 exits away from my house in Connecticut, and trained for the next five months in Texas to take approximately 280 soldiers and officers to Afghanistan in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. During the five months of training, we traveled and trained in several locations in Texas, California, then more training in Washington State before we all landed in Afghanistan in October 2009. As the sole military intelligence unit in Afghanistan, our soldiers were distributed throughout, dispersed throughout the 30 or more areas in the country at any time. So as a part of the command team, we had to conduct regular visits to our soldiers. So I regularly traveled with my colonel um, throughout the country via military uh, helicopters to visit um, those various locations that had our soldiers um, working at. Fifteen months after leaving my home and family, I returned to Connecticut in 2010. My family life continued. My husband was relieved from his dual Mr. Mom and Dad duties, and I resumed my dual career with the state police and the Army Reserves, um, the difference being that now I still remain assigned to the unit in Texas. So one to two weekends a month, 
I will fly to Texas for military duty until I retired from the military in 2012. Just prior to retiring from the military, I continued on with the first on the Connecticut State Police when I was promoted to the rank of major in December 2011, and later becoming the first woman to command a state police district. I retired from the Connecticut State Police in 2015. So this has been my journey as a young African-American girl who wanted to be everything before I finally focused on and figured out what I could do best and be the best at that. With the unique opportunity of having a dual career in law enforcement and the military, each of them 30 plus years or more, I have been honored to serve my country and the state of Connecticut for a combined total of 62 years. Following my recent appointment as the Deputy Commissioner of the Division of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, my service to the state of Connecticut continues. A new chapter begins, perhaps continuing towards the pursuit of being, of believing that I could be everything. So dream big, be inspired, and hope to inspire others. Thank you for allowing me to share my story.